During the summer of 1986, a ceremony at Loughborough Town Hall in Leicestershire recognised a 20-year association between a composer and an orchestra, Sir Michael Tippett and the Leicestershire School's Symphony Orchestra. For 20 years, those two very different worlds have combined, the small but expanding world of the young musician seeking experience and scholarship, and the pressured world of the well-known composer, wider but also still expanding and evolving. For a number of Leicestershire's young musicians, their first meeting with such a recognised composer has created the spark from which has grown the flame of a career in music. And for Sir Michael, Leicester is remembered as the city where he, as a schoolboy, received his first experience of live music. It was an amateur orchestral concert at Leicester's de Montfort Hall. The war was over, it was about 1919 or 20, and I was then in the sixth form of grammar school. This was Stamford Grammar School, where... Well, Malcolm Sargent had been there for ten years before preceding, and he was then the, known as the, as the Young Doctor. And he used to give a series of concerts at Leicester. And we were the six, some of the six form musical boys who were allowed to go over from Stamford for the evening were driven back in a coach, you see. And I can remember one piece, which is curious enough, was Mother Goose of Ravel. And I can hear the sound now. I know exactly, remember when I sat in the hall. And that was my first time my ears are really open to the possibilities. An inauspicious concert by all accounts, the orchestra depleted by the tragic losses of the First World War. But despite the advice of his parents and his teachers, including Malcolm Sargent, Tippett then took his first steps on the road to his career as a composer. He said quite rightly, he's not got the gifts of performance that will make him earn that, earn that money. I would strongly advise him not to, or advise you not to let him do so, because it didn't, did, that didn't work. My headmaster in Stanford School put it much better. Want to be a musician, he said. You'll never earn enough to get a boiled egg, let alone a boiled shirt. The organisation of music education on a county-wide basis was pioneered in Leicestershire after the Second World War, when the late Eric Pinkett was appointed the county's first music advisor in 1948. A teacher before the war, Pinkett had continued to work with music in the forces during the war years and was looking for a new direction for his career. There was a vacancy in Melton Mowbray, and I rang up the headmaster and went to see him. And I quite honestly believe that I got that job because I'm rather good at games, and he was very anxious to do games well at his school, and I was very anxious to play games too, so that by accident I came to Leicestershire, and after I'd been there for a year, the new director of education came to my school to look at uh, the music, and I think uh, uh, one of my other interests is that I paint quite a little. And he was terribly interested in painting, so that I'm not sure that I didn't become the music advisor because I can paint. Years later, both Eric Pinkett and Sir Michael Tippett were to be subjects for the distinguished portrait artist Brian Organ. But in 1948, Pinkett, as music advisor, had an empty canvas, no staff, few resources, and no precedents to follow. When we first started, I chose seven schools in different parts of the county where I myself went and taught them to play the instruments. Uh, and at the, at the end of the war, I felt that I could play well enough on most of the instruments of the orchestra. So I spent my time teaching in seven schools. And quite obviously, I could magnetize the children to play a new instrument for a short period. But after that, it becomes hard work. So I had got to do something to vitalize them. 
So I brought them in every Saturday to join together and to uh, play as an orchestra. And, of course, they played very badly. And it was my job then to make sure that they could play to other people because you were, it's your conceit that makes you anxious to get better and better. So I used to take them to the far-flung parts of the county. First concert, I remember, was in Church Langton, which in those days was just a little hamlet in the south-east of Leicestershire. And there we did a concert, so-called, and we had a bump of tea, and the headmaster told us how good we were, and that convinced us that we should go on to the next one. So it grew and grew as the years passed by. Eric Pinkett had a natural feeling for public relations, for achieving beneficial publicity from each decision and each action he took. He was well aware of the musical heritage of the village of Church Langton, for instance, where in 1759 the rector William Hanbury had staged the first performance of Handel's Messiah in an English parish church. Stuart Mason was succeeded by Andrew Fairburn as Director of Education for Leicestershire, and the support for Eric Pinkett's work continued. He was a man of uh, enormous energies, bubbling enthusiasms, who got his way uh, largely by charm, but also by just the nicest degree of deviousness. He was the person who could get instrumentalists out of young people. He was able very, very easily to spot talent. And as a result of this, of course, he laid the foundations of the Leicestershire School Symphony Orchestra by going around schools, talking to heads and uh, music staff, not putting them off in any way, because many music staff would be very sad to see their leading violinist or main trumpet player uh, being taken off to a county orchestra. But he had the ability to mould these youngsters together and gather a team round him which was extremely able in the development of sectional rehearsals. Eric Pinkett was also aware of the value of parental support for the young school of music. As shrewd as ever, he united parents and friends behind the common aim. One of the most excellent ways in which he did this was by the creation of the Friends of the County School of Music. These were obviously in the main parents of those who were going through all the ten orchestras, bands, etc., etc., but they were first-rate ambassadors. And I suppose his most successful effort, and quite the most difficult, was bringing together the two schools of music in Leicester and Leicestershire after local government reorganisation in 1974. Now, this could have been a very, very difficult thing. There were very sore spots, obviously, on both sides. Civic pride had been offended in Leicester. I can well understand this. But it was his diplomacy, his charm, his tact, which brought uh, the two sides together, the two friends, as it were, and as a result of this, the whole thing has melded together extremely well and has gone right forward without his ability. Uh, I wouldn't call it manipulation. I would call it diplomacy. Pinkett achieved recognition within Leicestershire, but by the early 60s he saw the need for the School of Music to be noticed by authorities outside the county. As we got better and better, so I knew I had to stretch the orchestra further and further and that I had to do other things and things which no one else had attempted. And the time came when I knew that we needed a patron. And my first thoughts were Sir Michael Tippett. And I wrote to him to see if I could come and talk to him about this. And he said, although he was interested and indeed had heard about us, which was very flattering, he said that he didn't think he could come up to Leicestershire to conduct... In, uh, indeed, my first thought was to ask him to conduct the orchestra before I asked him to become the patron. So he said he hadn't the time to come up. So I rang him up there and then and said if he hadn't the time to come up, then we'd come to him. So I went down to Corsham, which is a village in Wiltshire, where he lives. I saw him, and then I went on to the local school and borrowed it from them which they were very pleased to do, and we took the whole orchestra, stayed a week in the school, worked with Sir Michael, he came up every day, and uh, that's how he became part of us. Well, the real problem was straight away a matter of logistics. How was I going to get to this in order to do the rehearsing? And I'm a, I was a composer and therefore wanted to have time for composition. And the astonishing thing was when Eric said, well, there is no problem, we'll bring the children to you. 
they came in, it must have been one of the vacations, and, and were willing to do their own rehearsing in the morning, which, which I always wanted my mornings for composition, and I merely walk, could walk out of the, my house there, walk down to the schools, and do a, an afternoon rehearsal with them. And this was such an extraordinary idea, and I had, it's new to me, I hadn't been in that world. That I, that I then said, yes, this is, this is marvellous, and so that's how it all began. At that time, I think it was uh, not generally known, but he certainly knew, and so did my predecessor, Stuart Mason, who was Director of Education then, that Michael was looking for links with youth. Of course, his repertoire, etc., bears this out, in particular, the child of our time. But it would have been about that time and he was very anxious to sharpen his, his, his composing talents and his view of things by this particular link. And of course, as a result, uh, one of the first things he did when he became patron was to write the Shire's Suite for the Leicestershire School Symphony Orchestra. More than exciting, it was simply a re kind of revelation, if you like. I had no idea then to what extent Leicestershire, as it was, and the, the Shire, had um, I mean, had done in the musical field. And of course, I quite quickly met the director of education then, Mason, who was a rather remarkable man. I mean, how'd he come out? He'd come out, he was really first class. His interest is mainly in, not in music so much, but in, in the visual arts. But, but he was a real um, sort of go getter in his own kind of way. And he had been the med, planned so much, he, you know, where the children should be, where the school should be, where the campus would be, where the music could go on. All right, this was, this was a wonderful new world to me. Yes, in that sense, it was tremendous value. Sir Michael was involved almost immediately in a Leicestershire School's Festival of Music, held annually at Leicester's de Montfort Hall. The festival was inaugurated in 1965 under Sir Michael's patronage, and in 1967 no less than five new works were specially commissioned from leading British composers, including Malcolm Arnold, William Mathias, Alan Riddow and Sir Michael, who not only conducted the school's orchestra, but offered also an insight into the composition and structure of each work. What has always been quite remarkable to me is his quite natural, open and frank approach to adults here and particularly to the children. It was not always, I think, easy for someone coming in from outside to make immediate contact with the children. Sir Michael, I suppose, would be the first to agree that he wasn't a great conductor or anything of this sort. But that didn't matter in the least, because when he was rehearsing them for the Shire Suite, or indeed for any other work, he would always take a great deal of time and trouble to explain the build-up behind the particular composition. Indeed, not just his, but other, other works as well. And he was really so wonderful with them in the way he taught them. I think that's the best way to put it. In other words, he was a jolly good musical teacher. And this explanation of the thinking and the dynamic behind the work was the best way. In. And of course, the children loved him. No doubt at all about this. They still wanted more of him. In 1967, Sir Michael travelled with the Leicestershire School Symphony Orchestra to Belgium and in the same year conducted the orchestra for its first commercial record release. The album included a tippet work which had been commissioned by the BBC back in 1948, the suite for the birthday of Prince Charles.
The final jubilant event in Eric Pinkett's long tenure as county music advisor came in 1976 and was centred again on the de Montfort Hall, Europa Cantat VI. For ten days in July of that year, thousands of singers from Europe and beyond gathered in Leicester to study and to sing. The 22 professional soloists and 17 conductors were headed by the two names, Eric Pinkett and Sir Michael Tippett. It's a getting together of young singers and it's part of a, an interest in making Europe know itself more and it's partly an interest in, in the fact that, that uh, what are the university choirs, the young people's choirs, really want, like to sing together. So they, this was started some time ago and it's flourished because it has produ produced exactly what it meant to wonderful congregations of young people to sing all kinds of music. The music is no different from anything we want to do. They, it's, it's, not, it's no different from the Leicester sh School's orchestra playing. It simply is young people singing, and the, em the emphasis upon singing rather than orchestral playing. And therefore, it's, uh, I suppose it's a combination, too, for people who do it, of young people come with their wives and families or whatever you see, and you have a, therefore a mixture of, of being able to have a time away from term or whatever it may be, and you come and settle down for a fortnight and sing all the time. But the numbers are very large. If it adds up to 3,000 or whatever it is, then it makes its own audience even, which is a strange experience. As they all go to hear each other sing. And so when they break up into smaller groups, the others go to hear them. And so it's got a competitive element in it of a very good kind. Again, he was extremely valuable in the way in which he gave support and to the development of the great choral festival, Europa Cantat VI, here in Leicester, when 2,500 singers from nearly 20 countries came. He was extremely interested. He gave us a great deal of advice. He came up personally to talk about the music and the orchestras to play, and again, another example of the way in which he was prepared to move from the purely instrumental to the combination of choral and instrumental work. The opening promenade concert of the festival was provided by the Leicestershire School Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Eric Pinkett. On the following day, the inaugural concert, in the presence of the Duke of Gloucester, was presented again by the LSSO under the baton of Sir Michael. On Friday the 6th of August 1976, the young people of the many nations represented gave the most emotional concert of the festival, a performance of Sir Michael's oratorio, A Child of Our Time, first heard in that hall in 1944, when Tippett had conducted the Leicester Philharmonic Society. Sir Michael was present, sitting in the same auditorium where 56 years earlier Malcolm Sargent had stirred within him an enthusiasm for music. He heard young people from Israel and from Germany and from the countries of Europe that had been ravaged by war, singing together. And when I went to the Royal College of Music, there were, there were men there who were finishing their, their scholastic musical education, but were already had been through the trenches. And their experiences brought me in contact with this general feeling that existed after the First World War that could never happen again. When I got into Wormwood Scrubs on the first night, I, it, I don't mean to sound pretentious, but I felt I'd come home. And let's get this clear, I had written all Child of a Time already. Mm. I knew probably more about Nazi Germany than almost anybody alive in England at that time, odd enough. And I had written all the things about the boy who sings in his prison and all before I'd ever got there. And I simply belonged for the moment amongst 
the other side because I'd, I'd done these things. Europa Cantat VI marked a turning point in the development of music education in Leicestershire. Sir Michael's association with the county had been beneficial to both parties, but the needs of both the composer and the county were changing. Before the final concert of Europa Cantat, Sir Michael spoke briefly of his responsibilities as a composer to the musical education of young people. One's role of composer chiefly is to compose, that's clear. And insofar as, well, you get to the age I am now, you may have to give up a lot of other things in order to be certain that you have all the energies of composition. When you're younger, you can do a great deal other things than just composition. You want to come out and meet audiences and meet people and performers, especially professional people. Now, this means that, that you have an obligation, it seems to me, as a living composer, to a great many goings-on, if I put it that way. The accident of being mixed up with the Leicestershire Education Authority and through them with the, with the Leicestershire Schools Orchestra, this, it was their choice and it was an extraordinarily happy one. And I've been, therefore, retained it, though I can't do what I used to do and come every year, that sort of thing. But I regard it, of course, as part of my being a composer. But now my job would be to, to keep all my energies for composition. After a commitment to the School of Music lasting almost 30 years, Eric Pinkett retired. His successor was Peter Fletcher. After so many years of expansion, music education was facing harsh financial restraints, and Andrew Fairburn suggested that the incoming county music advisor should make a formal visit to talk to Sir Michael at the earliest opportunity. That was the, the first thing I think I suggested to him, and this would have been about 1976. At that time, there were the first restrictions appearing and for example out of the 50 peripatetic teachers of instrumental music in the county there was a cut of I think 10. Now this was quite terrifying and again Sir Michael uh, was able to use his influence quite indirectly and behind the scenes in order to begin to get across to the Education Committee and County Council that this was really a quite ridiculous thing to do. With the help of Sir Michael's influence, many of those cuts were restored in 1981. But when Peter Fletcher arrived in the county, he was faced with both the problems of rationalisation and the need to redefine Sir Michael's association with the School of Music. By the time I'd arrived, Sir Michael's involvement was, if not dead, at least in ice. And it was suggested to me by Andrew Fairbairn that I should make contact with Sir Michael. You must remember that at this time, the kind of hero worship that's going on now was not in evidence at all. Only a few people actually realised what a significant figure Sir Michael was. And I was really rather embarrassed about this because I was trying to find a way of getting the orchestra to be involved, let me say, in a modern way with music, and to find people who would write for the orchestra at a time when actually composers were rather steering away from the symphony orchestra. It's quite a recent thing that composers are writing so much for the major symphony orchestras. At that time, one found composers writing more for smaller chamber groups. And I'd also realised that Tippett's style had gone way beyond and certainly what Leicestershire could actually technically perform, and that the period at which the Leicestershire Orchestra could be useful to him had passed. So I went to see him, and we had a slightly awkward first half hour, at the end of which we had clearly established that I understood that his involvement in the orchestra was a thing of the past and that he didn't wish to be involved with it as a composer, certainly, or at that time as a conductor any longer, that he recognised that and I recognised that, after which we proceed to have a what I take to be a typically generous luncheon and a marvellous chat afterwards about jazz and America and almost anything except Leicestershire. Throughout the 1970s, contemporary music remained preeminent in the repertoire of the Leicestershire School Symphony Orchestra. Peter Fletcher valued and respected the influence of Sir Michael, using the structure of the past but extending the earlier concepts for the future. When Eric Pinkett was building up the Leicestershire School Symphony Orchestra, it was not an accepted part of life that counties would have schools symphony orchestras. So it was necessary at that time to get people to realise that you actually could have a school symphony orchestra. 
As for the PR aspect, that's obviously important. I was in a slightly equivocal position um, over this with Sir Michael because I knew that technically he was our patron. He had told me himself that in the nicest possible way that the period in which the orchestra and he were mutually useful to each other was over and I've never liked actually to go after names um, to sell a thing on a name I want to sell the thing on the integrity of the thing so I mean I made it clear and uh, never ceased to remind people um, of Sir Michael's involvement with the orchestra but I was far more keen and I'm sure Sir Michael would respect this view that the orchestra should justify itself uh, not because it once uh, had a distinguished composer conducting it or because that composer is still its patron but more on its own merits and what I had to do was to find a way of training these youngsters in a way that was right for their training, right for the PR aspects and right in the way of stretching them. The useful thing that, if you like, I was able to cash in on was a notion of a composer working with an orchestra. Now, Douglas Young was in residency when I arrived, and interestingly, he felt that really it was only after his three years' residency in Leicestershire, having been resident in Cambridge and having come from the ivory tower that he had adjusted sufficiently to realize what he actually could do and that was the start of a marvelous relationship in which i like to think that we performed a similar service to douglas in that what he wrote had to be playable by the orchestra and what we commissioned had to be something that he wanted to write so, in a sense, he, like Sir Michael before him, was able to use the orchestra to make a number of experiments in his own personal style and to try things out with an orchestra that was willing and eager to do it and to learn through the process of writing for the orchestra. Uh, conversely, the orchestra itself uh, was given a whole range of new experiences. We began to talk about things like Douglas Young clusters on the percussion. There were certain stereotypes, as there are with any composer, but but I think it was a mutually advantageous relationship that grew from the precedent of having Sir Michael. And the other thing, of course, was that although I can, would not say for a moment that Leicestershire was just waiting to hear contemporary music, indeed, when I started performing contemporary music here, people thought that uh, I'd gone off my rocker if I did anything that wasn't by Beethoven. It was really quite extraordinary. But it was a useful precedent, and I felt that this was the right way to use Sir Michael's name, to be pointing out that Leicestershire had been working with what is now regarded as the major composer of this country, and indeed, I would say, of our time, and that surely we ought to be into contemporary music, so that it helped, in a sense, to get this notion that we would be performing regularly music by living composers. It helped to get that notion across to a bewildered and unbelieving public. Just the place for a snark, the bellman cried as he landed his crew with care, supporting each man on the top of the tide by a finger entwined in his hair. And so the orchestra entered a programme of 20th century music. Douglas Young's three-year term as composer-in-residence to the Leicestershire Education Committee produced Virages Region 1, The Hunting of the Snark, Third Night Journey Under the Sea, and Rain, Steam and Speed. In the years that followed, Sir Michael visited Leicestershire infrequently. His influence, however, remained not only in the continuing emphasis on contemporary music and the concept of composers working with training orchestras, but also in the hidden facets of a school of music's work. Responding to the cutbacks of the mid-1970s, a new animal was born in Leicestershire, with Andrew Fairburn as its senior officer and Sir Michael as its patron, 
It was christened llama. Llama is not uh, a strange South American animal, uh, I think, from the Andes. It's the acronym for the Leicestershire Appeal for Music and the Arts. Because of these cutbacks, to which I've referred, we established a charity called Llama. It was patronised by Sir Michael. It sought to build up a capital fund which would ensure that all the things like the music, instruments, scores, all the essential stationery, I would call it, of music, would not suffer as a result of the cuts. And we very quickly, again, with his help and advice, built up a capital sum of well over 50,000 in a very short space of time. And we've been able to use this since for the development, for example, of music therapy amongst uh, the not-so-gifted youngsters. We've been able to use it for help with the development of Indian classical music because of the very large number of the ethnic minority in Leicestershire. And indeed, by giving grants to a whole host of small primary schools in the rural areas who, without this sort of assistance, simply would not be able to buy the recorders, the small instruments, the sheet music, etc., which is essential if, in fact, this subject is to continue to hold its own in the curriculum today. So it's been extremely valuable, and we have been able, as a result of his patronage, to build up and go on building up the capital sum. It is always there, and it's something, again, which I believe it's very important for most uh, educational authorities to think about doing. Lama continues to support the work of the School of Music, as does that other organisation, the Friends of the School of Music. And in recent years, the Michael Tippett Foundation has been created. Leicestershire has already seen the benefits. Certainly we in Leicestershire have used it for young people who have a very evident talent and need to undertake master classes for a year in London or even abroad for that matter before they go on to music college. We have been able to plug into that foundation for youngsters who come from quite ordinary average homes uh, and without the assistance which they have been able to get from it to undertake these master classes with first-rate executives generally in London their talent simply would not have burgeoned and, in fact, led them on to extremely worthwhile musical careers. A composer and an orchestra, a living and developing relationship of over 20 years, and one that has brought great benefit to the music education of Leicestershire. If we're talking about accessibility, and if we're talking about getting down from the ivory tower, we could be talking about two separate things. Um, I do not think it is the responsibility of a living composer to compromise his style in order that um, kids might get some, what one might say for better word, fun out of his music. And I think there's far too much of that going on, frankly. And I think there's a, there's a great danger at the moment with the, with the very proper movement towards what we loosely call community art, that composers may well be compromising some of their deeper integrity in order to sell themselves. On the other hand, I think it is absolutely essential that not only composers, by the way, performers as well should come off their ivory tower and should be put into situations where people find their offerings totally incomprehensible. Now, it may or may not be that the composer or performer concerned is able actually to cope with that situation at all, but I think he should at least be aware of that situation. Um, and the opportunity to write for young people is something that I think every composer ought to take. But that, in a sense, brings us neatly round to Michael Tippett again, because I think the thing that, to me, makes Tippett, perhaps with Ives, unique 
in this century is that he has attempted, perhaps at the expense of making his music at times vastly complex, to embrace, as it were, all at once the cultural problems of this century and to incorporate in his style, for example, the popular music of his day, of the enormous number of short-lived pieces of musical possibility that have been explored in the name of a new aesthetic during his long life. All these things, along with blues and the jazz, and a tremendous concern for the generality of the human condition, is evident in in an indescribable, because it's a purely musical way, in his purely musical works, but he's certainly there, if you like, to simply to look at the kinds of themes that he has tackled in his operatic subjects. So that I think if Leicestershire hadn't written to Tippett, my suspicion is that Tippett would have found a Leicestershire somewhere in order to go and get that experience. And I wish more composers would do that kind of thing. Well, of course, it added a new dimension to the local development of music education. His name, of course, was extremely valuable with members of the County Council and the Education Committee. It was a great honour to meet someone like this, and it obviously put in their mind the fact that someone of this eminence and interest saw music not as a minority subject, but as a major subject and something very, very important in the development of youngsters in their move forward to adulthood. Secondly, it was very valuable in the fact that it did contribute towards the recruitment and engagement of people from the main orchestras of this country who would come in as peripatetic teachers for a short period of time. The fact that they could come back, refresh themselves and their youngsters because of their own excellent techniques. I think the fact that he was linked with Leicestershire helped enormously. Thirdly, of course, it did help a very great deal in the publication of gramophone records, particularly during Peter Fletcher's time, the quite right concentration on contemporary music, particularly contemporary British music, had a great deal to do with the fact that Tippett's works were committed to disc by the orchestra on quite a number of occasions. So in all these particular ways, it was very valuable. I only wish that other composers and people, contemporaries of Michael Tippett's, would take up orchestras themselves in the same way that he has patronised Leicestershire. It would do an enormous amount of good for music education in this country, and my word, it needs it. The work at the School of Music, developing over a period of almost 40 years, now provides a variety of schemes for the support and coordination of music teaching in the county. Today, the school is based in the centre of Leicester, where facilities include a concert hall and rehearsal rooms. The concert manager is Peter Easton. We reach all over the county, just about. I mean, some areas rather thinly, in that, for instance, in trying to cover all the instruments of the orchestra, we, we have one teacher of the double bass. We have one teacher of bassoon for the whole county. We manage to cover every orchestral instrument. And some interesting new areas. For instance, for three years now, we've been running a project on Indian music teaching, which is now very well established going into a lot of schools, not only in Leicester, but also in other parts of the county. We've added to our range of groups recently with a big band, a youth choir, again, a county-wide organisation, and the rest of the groups comprise five orchestras meeting once a week, four wind bands and two string groups that sort of support the orchestras at a basic level. We run a preliminary string group and a junior strings and from one of those two groups, they'd be unlikely to play in both of them, I think. They'd expect to go on to the junior orchestra, the intermediate orchestra, and then a training orchestra that normally prepares people to go on into the Leicestershire School Symphony Orchestra. We run a second eleven, the concert orchestra, that caters for older children who perhaps don't want to play quite as much music as the LSSO plays or be committed to quite such a heavy programme. Working with the youth choir is a teacher of voice. Her work also reaches into the primary and secondary schools in the county. Students enter any level of the orchestras and bands by audition 
and all children, both existing and prospective players, are auditioned each year. The repertoire still demonstrates a strong commitment to the work of contemporary living composers. Leicestershire has made something of a name for itself in not only working with contemporary living, if you like, composers and conductors, but also in offering a fairly solid diet of contemporary music to the children in the orchestra. They, of course, play other areas of the repertoire, but generally the summer programme is given over to 20th century music, and that has regularly included commissions or other pieces of music that have been written in recent times by English composers. There's a fairly healthy list now of first British concert performances. We've just done one this summer of a piece by Zanarkis, the Paris-based composer. We generally give the programme a tryout in Leicester Cathedral, and the list of British concert premieres in Leicester Cathedral is now quite, quite substantial. Music by Xenarchus, a recording of the Leicestershire School Symphony Orchestra of 1982 under the baton of Peter Fletcher. And so to the Charnwood Theatre at Loughborough Town Hall in the summer of 1986, the setting for the most recent memorable event in the long history of music education in Leicestershire and its association with Sir Michael. Well, the concert in Loughborough is a happy coincidence of several things. It's first of all a pre-tour concert for the LSSO. They go off a week afterwards to Italy to stay in Florence for a week and give six concerts in Tuscany. The other aspect of the concert is the presence of Sir Michael Tippett and not only is it very nice to have him there to wish the orchestra well on its tour, but we're taking the opportunity to ask him to unveil a bust of himself that has been completed under a commission from ourselves by a Leicestershire sculptress. This bust was commissioned last year as part of the orchestra's way of celebrating Sir Michael's 80th birthday. We took the opportunity to renew the association with him. He accepted an invitation to conduct the orchestra when they gave a concert as part of the Bath Festival. The orchestra presented him with a pair of engraved cufflinks which was a rather nice way of them saying happy birthday to him. As a school of music, we thought we ought to do something on a, a rather grander scale, hence the commission for a bust. After Tippett's Fanfare for Brass, conducted by the present County Music Advisor, Stuart Johnson, Leicestershire's Director of Education, Keith Wood Allen, welcomed Sir Michael back to Leicestershire. Sir Michael's long association with the Leicestershire School Symphony Orchestra 
began in 1965 when the orchestra held its Easter course at Corsham in Wiltshire. And this is very close indeed to Sir Michael's home. Sir Michael had kindly and generously accepted an invitation to become the patron of the first Leicestershire School's uh, Festival of Music. Sir Michael, I have the greatest possible pleasure on behalf of the orchestra and of the friends to invite you to unveil the bronze. I was, would never have been a teacher in the f sense to which Eric Pinkett was dedicated to it. He was marvellously, because he was really dedicated to that particular thing and built something that came within the educational system. I only take, receive the, the value from it. It's so extraordinary what qualities these players have, these young players. All right, and you get, and you get a sensibility and understanding which is, which is breathtaking. And also what Leicestershire knows very well in its tradition, and even and very much so under Peter Fletcher, was that they don't only play, as it were, the classics or try to emulate the, the big orchestras that play them, but they play a lot of new music of all kinds. And, and in a sense, part of the school's orchestras have become the sort of standard bearers of new pieces. They do first performances, as you know very well yourself. That's marvellous. The young people of the School of Music here will leave the orchestra at about the age of 18, having received quite a few years of consistent music education. Now, when you were 18, it was probably about the time when you first heard live music. There was nothing like the education there is now whatsoever, nor in a way did, did, pe did people understand to what extent that the, the, the music is a huge... Um, business. I mean, it's, it's, it's worldwide. There are, there are jobs of all kinds, not only performing, but in recording and in man managerial capacities. Therefore, to have an education which you could get here in music is not merely the matter of, of, of performing, it's a matter of being able to enter this tremendous worldwide activity, meaning so much to millions of human beings. So that that has changed, I think, the idea of education as to what music, what music can be, because music is therefore something, not only you might get a job by, but something you give an immense pleasure and refreshment to many, many folk. Is there any particular route that you would recommend to a young composer? No, not at all. That would have to be their own affair. It's the world, it's a very competitive world, and you'd have to make up your mind which, whether you only wanted to go into rock music, for example, that is a very specialized affair, and your life may be very limited. The business of being a composer like myself in my tradition is a, is a much slower thing, probably, and demands some concern, probably, what the world is about and what, and what human beings want from, from that part of the music. It may be that you can go into rock music and, and you are only for a particular generation, and, it's, and it changes. It's going to change the fashion, change every 10 years at least very little is left behind. It's a di that extent is a different world, and you are me it's something immediate. But if you want something which is going to live beyond your own generation as a composer, then, you have, then it's something else. And there, again, the number of composers now who want to do that is very great all over the world. The competition is terrific, but it means that you've got, you've got to work very hard and be very good and be able to do it. What that is is a mystery. No one really knows. I am a, just started on another long work for the theatre, and it, it's a three-year stint, and I've done a half a year already. All right, I hope I'm going to be as healthy and as vigorous and lively as I am now in order to finish it. But the point is, is whatever it is, however young you are, whatever you appear to be, nevertheless, the major part of the works are done. And I'm not interested in any way in the very early pieces, but I am interested in what I do now. And again, I would not do it just for money or even in order to, to have more acclaim or what. In fact, I, that worry would worry me, the feeling that it would have to be a masterpiece or whatever. But I do it because there's something I still really there to say. Now, in the end, that will stop. And whether it stops at the end of the next two and a half years or whether there's something else, that will be determined by something quite outside myself. But I shall have to go on till the end and, have, and that, that will really actually be the end. The works are outside me. This is vital. We don't really know who Shakespeare was, but we, God help us, we know what the works are. 
And that is the, that is the dream world. The dream world, or whatever I say, that is to me the world. I belong in that tradition, however small it is, that is where it is. You make something which is outside yourself. Now that has meaning for other generations, if it's good, or if it does something. That's all we can say. There's no more to it than that. But the fact that one has accepted that as a young man or young woman and lived it and right through, and you've had the luck not to be atomized under an atom bomb, as it were, then you're, then you may, then you've done something. That's all you can say. But you have to, I don't know what you have to make a blessing and what, what the blessings are. We really don't know anymore. Look, the great thing is, if I thought too much about that, I wouldn't do it. See, I would live on something that's happened. Whereas, I'm at this moment, I talk to you now, and I've driven over three hours to get here, but I assure you that my real self is back at my home in some new work where I have to begin as though I were a beginner. And every time I do a new work, I begin again from zero. No, well, that's not nonsense, but I begin again from being on the ground so that I have to leave all these problems of whether I'm good or bad or whether in the 20th century or 21st century somebody wants to listen to them as we all left aside.